Hello everyone. Welcome back to the free lecture series on aerodynamics organized by Learn CAX. Basic concepts. This is the second video lecture of this course. To understand aerodynamics, there are a few basic concepts that need to be clear. As this course is designed for beginners, I assume that the viewer is not familiar with most of the basic concepts. This lecture would explain you those basic concepts that will help to understand this subject better. I promise you to keep mathematics to a minimum possible level and still explain the concepts in a simpler way without disturbing the core meaning. Here is the outline of this lecture. We will start with motion of objects and the laws governing them. Also, we will discuss on forces exerted by fluids on a moving body. Do you remember the cases discussed in the previous lecture, your curious mind? Let's start this lecture with a look back at those examples. In the previous lecture, we discussed on different real life situations starting from design change of cars, trains and wind turbines over the year, wind loads on high buildings and structures flight of aircrafts and some physics behind sports like F1 racing, cricket, baseball and football. They all have one thing in common. A fluid-solid interaction and a relative motion between the fluid and the solids. For example, take the case of a high-rise building or long bridges. Here, the atmospheric air moves around the stationary solid structures. That is, the solid is at rest while the air is in motion. In some cases, the solid object moves in a still air. In the example shown here, the solid objects like cycle, baseball, car, train are moving. Please note that the air might also be moving with solid objects. For example, consider a sailboat or a wind turbine which is at rest. When the air moves around the wind turbine, the stationary turbine blade starts rotating. Same happens with the case of sailboats. The point here is both the fluid and solid are in motion. In all these cases discussed till now, there is a fluid-solid interaction. The fluid here is air. In some cases, air moves around a stationary solid and in some cases, the solid moves in stationary air. There are also cases where both air and solid are in motion. And hence, there is a relative motion between air and the solids. Aerodynamics is the study of effects of the relative motion between the solid and the air. But before studying about the effects of the motion, let us discuss on what governs this motion. Yeah, I know it's not fair to disturb Sir Newton even after he provided all his valuable findings to the world. But can't help. It's not possible to explain or understand motion without disturbing our Sir. Jokes apart, let's look at these three laws of motion. Here it goes. The first law of motion states that every body preserves in its state of being at rest or of moving uniformly straight forward except in so far as it is compelled to change its state by forces impressed. The second law says a change in motion is proportional to the motive force impressed and takes place along the straight line in which that force is impressed. And the third law says to every action there is always opposed an equal reaction or the mutual actions of two bodies upon each other are always equal and directed to the contrary parts. Oof! Too many words to digest, isn't it? Don't worry. We will look at each law in detail and try to understand them. But before that, it will be helpful to know about the forces and different type of forces. 
A force is a push or pull upon an object due to the object's interaction with another object. Whenever there is an interaction between two objects, there is a force upon each of the objects. Forces only exist as a result of an interaction and depending on the way the objects are interacting with each other, they can be broadly named in two categories. First, forces or interactions that happen without direct contact between two objects. Some forces like Earth's gravity don't need a contact with objects. They act on the mass of the objects from a distance. Gravitational force is that force with which the Earth, Moon or other massively large object that attracts other objects towards itself. In other words, this is the weight of the object. Another example is magnetic force which acts on ferromagnetic materials like iron. They not only pull things towards them but can also create a push force. The second category of force is the one which results due to direct contact between objects. And within this category, there are different types of forces. We will have a quick view on few of these forces. To start with, normal force, which is the support force exerted upon an object, which is in contact with another stable object. In this case, the stable object is the dance floor or the stage, which supports the weight of the dancers. Next is the friction force, which is the force exerted by a surface as an object moves across it or makes an effort to move across it. The friction force often opposes the motion of the object. For example, in baseball, when a runner slides to reach the base, a friction force is generated as a result of interaction between the runner's body and the ground. This friction force acts in opposing direction of runner's motion and it is the reason why the runner slows down and stops after some time. The funny fact is, without this friction force acting on him, the runner would never stop sliding unless he hits any other obstacle on his way. Friction depends on the nature of the two interacting surfaces and on the degree to which they are pressed together. Magnitude of friction can be reduced with the help of wheels or lubricants like oil. The interaction always doesn't need to be between two solid objects. The interaction can also be between a solid object and its surrounding fluid. The fluid resistance is a special type of frictional force that acts on objects as they travel through the fluid. The force of fluid resistance is often observed to oppose the motion of the object. Fluid includes both gases and liquids. Most common examples are objects moving in air and water. When the fluid is air, the forces associated with that are known as aerodynamic forces. Although I mentioned that the aerodynamic forces oppose the motion of the object. In some cases, depending on the shape and size of the object, they also generate a force perpendicular to the motion of the object. Aircrafts take advantage of these forces. We will discuss on this in detail in the next lecture. Now that we know some of the forces, we will try to identify different forces acting on a body. Let us take an example of a car parked on the road. At this stage, weight of the car acts downward and to support the weight of the car, the normal force acts upwards at the contact area between the tires and the road. And when a driving force is applied to move the car in one direction, Friction forces are generated in the opposite direction of car's motion. And in a way, it is because of the friction 
when the driving force makes the wheel to rotate backward, a reaction force is generated to move the car forward. We will see about this reaction force in a short time. Adding to that, air also offers some resistance force to car's motion. Not only that, as discussed in the previous slide, the design of car can also generate a force perpendicular to the motion of the car. Remember the case of F1 cars discussed in the previous lecture? Right, the design of the front and rear wings generates the downforce, which is perpendicular to the car's motion. Coming back to Newton's three laws of motion, we will start understanding each law one by one. An object which is at rest or an object moving with a uniform velocity will continue to remain in its state of motion. That is, the velocity does not change unless an external unbalanced force acts on it. Let us split this into two statements. An object at rest stays at rest unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. We have observed this in many situations. One such example is bowling. The pins which are at rest stay at rest unless they are hit by the bowling ball which is the unbalanced force here. To support the pin's weight, the normal force acting are equivalent to the weight of the pin. Hence, the forces are balanced and the pins continue to stay at rest. But when the ball hits the pins, it interacts with the pins. As a result of this interaction, a new force is generated. This new force creates an imbalance in the system and causes the pins to change its state of motion or in other words, the pin changes its velocity. Let's look at the second part of the first law. An object in motion stays in motion with the same speed and in the same direction unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. No way! This is a bit of conflicting with what we see in day-to-day -day life. Because every moving object we see eventually comes to a stop. For example, consider a cue ball which is at rest on a pool table. It stays at rest unless it is hit by the stick. When the stick hits the ball, it acts as an unbalanced force and sets the ball in motion. This is in line with the first law. But within a short time, the ball comes to rest. This doesn't go with the first law. Why is it so? The answer is, once the ball starts moving with a velocity, an unbalanced friction force is exerted by the surface of the table on the moving ball in the opposite direction. This unbalanced force changes the ball's state of motion, that is, slows down the ball and brings it to rest. Ok, suppose by some means we manage to reduce the friction between the surface and the ball to a minimum possible level. Guess what will happen? The ball will continue in its state of motion till it hits any obstacle or unbalanced force. This might be observed while playing air hockey. Air is blown through small pores on the hockey table which lifts the puck just above the table, thus avoiding the surface, surface contact, that is, avoids friction. So, when it is set to motion, it continues to move in the same speed and in the same direction unless it hits the end of the table. A similar behavior can be seen on an air track glider too. Hence, it is clear that objects tend to keep on doing what they are doing and resist to change its state of motion. This tendency is called inertia. Every body has inertia and resists to change their state of motion. Inertia varies with mass of the object. Heavier mass has more inertia than the lesser mass. 
You can experience this when you try to move a big rock and a small pebble. Objects at rest or objects with uniform motion will never accelerate or never changes its velocity when all the forces acting on it are balanced. So the net force on the object is zero. First law of motion talks about the behavior of the objects for which all the existing forces are balanced. Second law of motion helps to predict the behavior of objects for which the forces are not balanced. It says the presence of an unbalanced force will accelerate an object, changing its speed, its direction or both its speed and direction. The acceleration of an object depends directly on the net force acting on it and inversely on the mass of the object itself. As the force acting upon an object is increased, the acceleration of the object increases. And for the same net force, when the mass of the object is increased, the acceleration of the object decreases. Now let's take two identical objects with the same mass and apply two different net forces on them. Yes, as expected from second law of motion, the object on which the higher net force acted accelerates more than the other one. Also, the direction of motion is same as that of the net force. So, for the same mass, when the net force acting on the object is increased, the acceleration of the object is increased. Moving on to the third law of motion which says, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. The statement means is that in every interaction there is a pair of forces acting on the two interacting objects. The size of the forces on the first object equals the size of the force on the second object. The direction of the force on the first object is opposite to the direction of the force on the second object. Forces always come in pairs equal and opposite while one is called the action force the other one is called the reaction force. For example, when you lean or push against the wall, the wall pushes on you with an equal amount of push but against you in the opposite direction. Another relevant example is the motion of rocket. The hot exhaust gas flowing out of the rear of the rocket is an action force. In reaction, the rocket is pushed in the opposite direction. Here is an interesting case involving all the three laws of motion. Imagine an astronaut with a football in space. What a crazy football fan he must be. But our focus here is what happens when the astronaut pushes or throws the football in a direction away from him. As expected from third law, the football exerts an equal push on the astronaut in the opposite direction. Although the magnitude of action and reaction forces are same, the mass on which it acts differs. So the action force acting on the lighter mass, that is, football results in more acceleration, while the reaction force acting on the heavier mass makes the astronaut to accelerate less. Now the forces are balanced and the inertia will make both astronaut and the ball to travel with a constant velocity achieved from the respective accelerations. When a similar exercise is performed on earth, the motion of the ball is completely different. When a goalkeeper throws the football away from him, the ball moves forward, falls down on the ground, then bounces a bow and finally it slides on the ground and stops after some time. Unlike the ball's motion in space, here the moving ball comes to a rest. The reason for this is, when the ball moves, it is acted upon by number of unbalanced forces like gravitational force which makes the ball to fall, reaction force with which the ball bounces back, friction force due to interaction of ball with ground that brings the ball to rest. Wait, wait, 
Are we missing something which is of our interest? Yes. We miss the force generated as a result of interaction between the ball and the air. These forces are called aerodynamic forces. From now, our focus will be towards these forces. Although we call it by a name, what are these forces? Why these forces are generated with solid fluid interactions? To answer these questions, we have to understand the behavior of fluids first. Let's do an interesting brainstorming session. Assume an elephant with a mass of 1000 kgs and a peacock feather of 0.1 kg, both dropped from the same height above the ground at the same time. To make it simpler, we will assume both the objects are experiencing free fall. That is, the only force they are subjected to is the gravitational force. The air resistance acting on the object is negligible. Or, let's say we are doing this in an XYZ planet where there is no atmospheric air or any other gases. It's completely vacuum. And the gravitational acceleration of that planet is 10 meters per second square. The question is, which one of these objects will touch the ground first, or which one will fall faster? If I say both will land at the same time, would you buy that answer? I guess it's confusing. Okay, let me help you with this one. Let's calculate the net force acting on the objects. As we assume free fall, the only force acting on the objects is the gravitational force, which is nothing but the weight of the object. So, the net force acting on the feather is its weight, which is nothing but the mass times the gravitational acceleration. Same is applicable for the elephant also. We can see from calculations, the net force acting on the elephant is much more than that of the feather. But still, why both will fall at the same rate? Because the mass of the objects are different, their inertia is also different. As the elephant with more mass has more inertia, more force is needed to change its rate of motion. We can prove this if we calculate the acceleration with which they fall toward the ground. From second law, acceleration can be calculated using the net force and the mass of the objects. This comes out to be the same for both the objects. So both the elephant and the feather will approach at the same rate and touch the ground at the same time. Hence, we can conclude, when the net force acting on the object is only due to gravity, all the objects fall with the same acceleration, irrespective of their mass. But now, let's make it more interesting. What if we do the same experiment on Earth? Now, in addition to the gravitational force which is acting downward, there will be a force due to air acting in the upward direction to oppose the motion. So, the same question, which one will touch the ground first? From our practical observations and human instincts, most of us will say, the elephant which is heavier in mass will fall first. It might be correct to some extent. But are we saying the object with more mass experiences less air resistance? If we are saying so, then take a single paper, drop it from a certain height. Note down the time it takes to reach the ground. Now crumple the same paper and drop it from the same height. Do you see the crumpled paper falls on the ground in a shorter time? In the earlier case, the mass of the two objects were different and the one with the heavier mass fell faster. But now, it's the same paper being dropped twice. The mass of the object is same. But why the crumpled paper reaches the ground faster? Or why the crumpled paper experienced less resistance? If not mass, what else is doing this? Is it the shape and size of the object falling down? Think on this. 
We will discuss on this and much more on terminal velocity in the third lecture of this course. Thanks for listening. And if you have any feedback or queries, you can mail us at info at learncax.com. See you around for the second part of this lecture.